Greetings and welcome to the lecture video for assignment number 25, in which we'll be talking about the 10th Amendment in the Rehnquist Court era. So in our last class, we talked about the Rehnquist Court and sort of the modern current approach to the Commerce Clause, uh, which is the debate, of course, about how much power <clears throat> Congress has under uh, its Commerce Clause powers. And as we've been going through this discussion about the Commerce Clause, we've been sort of going back and forth between talking about the Commerce Clause and then talking about sort of the flip side of that coin, which is the Tenth Amendment, where we're having the debate about how much protection does the Constitution give to um, states' ability to regulate certain things without there being any kind of federal intrusion. Now, when we last talked about the Tenth Amendment way back in our pre-spring break lives, uh, we looked a little bit at what I call the transition to the Rehnquist Court uh, era. Uh, and this is when we read um, the case of National League of Cities versus Usury. Um, usury, this is where we have the Tenth Amendment, the court tells us, um, does reserve a zone of activities purely for the states. It says that there are certain types of state activities that were traditional or integral uh, to state powers, and those are protected from federal intrusion um, for the states. Um, so we also mentioned uh, quickly how the court decided a case in 1980, the Hodel case, uh, where it said, okay, the National League of Cities decision applies only to regulation purely of uh, state uh, government, and it basically gives us this, this idea that uh, Congress cannot regulate what they called states qua states, states being states, states acting as states. Uh, that's the activity that we are trying to isolate and say that it is protected from uh, congressional regulation. But then, uh, less than a decade later, the court decided the Garcia case, and in this case, they overruled National League of City, uh, League of Cities. Um, the court said that it had just proven to be unworkable to use this zone of activities uh, approach. It wasn't clear what was or wasn't a traditional or integral um, state activity, and it left, therefore, too much discretion up for uh, the judges. If you may recall, I pointed out in class uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist's very short uh, dissent in that case, uh, where he basically just says, um, you all are really wrong, and um, I, uh, someday we will get our fifth vote back for this decision, and we are going to uh, reverse this uh, decision. So today, we'll take a look at what the Rehnquist Court did when talking about the uh, 10th Amendment to see if they did just that. Our first clue that something might be afoot at the Supreme Court uh, came in the 1991 case of Gregory versus Ashcroft. So this case involved um, some state court judges in Missouri, and they challenged a provision of a state uh, constitutional uh, provision which set a mandatory retirement age for judges. And they said this violates, this rule violates the federal law, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And the court there said um, that this federal law applies uh, to, uh, or that we're going to interpret this federal law as applying to important state government activity like this one only if there is what they called a clear statement from Congress that the law was intended to apply to states. So they said it wasn't completely clear on the face of the law if Congress intended to try to apply the Age Discrimination and Employment Act to state governments. And without that clear statement, the court was going to assume that um, it was not trying to do this. So this was considered to be um, while it wasn't an explicit use of the Tenth Amendment, uh, it was a federalist, federalism-based, Tenth Amendment-based rule of construction in terms of how we are going to interpret um, different kinds of federal laws. So it was a year after uh, Gregory versus Ashcroft that we got a bigger clue 
from the Rehnquist Court about how it was going to handle Tenth Amendment issues. And, and that was in the case of New York versus United States. So this case was the second time since the pivotal year of 1937 when the court found um, a uh, act of Congress to be unconstitutional because it violated the first or the Tenth Amendment. Now, of course, the first time the court found that was in the National League of Cities case, which it had later overruled. So this case involved the problem of nuclear waste storage by the states. Um, the issue was that there were some states that were simply becoming sort of America's dumping ground uh, for everybody else's radioactive waste. And when we get to uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause, which we'll be talking about in this uh, class soon, we will see that the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, prevents states from just saying, we're only gonna take our own waste uh, we can't, uh, we won't take any waste that comes from out of state. So these states were sort of helpless in terms of everybody sending them this nuclear radioactive waste uh, that they didn't want to have. So uh, what happened here is that the National Governors Conference got together and came up with this really complicated uh, compromise that they had uh, proposed to the federal government. And it was a regime that had three different parts. I don't think they were really fully explained in your book, but let's talk about them for a second. The first part of the plan relied on monetary incentives for the states. Uh, this part of the law provided, allowed states to, that were um, receiving the waste to collect surcharges for waste that they received from other states. Um, and then the Secretary of Energy, the, the, the federal government, took this, these surcharges and put them in an escrow account. And then um, other states, uh, if they achieved a certain number of milestones in developing uh, disposal sites, they could receive a portion of this fund. And this part of the federal law was held to be uh, constitutional under Congress's powers to tax and spend, which we'll be talking about in our uh, next lecture. The court said there was just, this was completely unexceptionable. There, there was just nothing unusual about this kind of use of power by uh, Congress. The second part of the law relied on what they called access incentives. Uh, these authorized states that had disposal sites uh, to be able to gradually increase the cost of access to their sites and then to deny, um, eventually deny access to them altogether uh, to waste that was generated in states that weren't meeting uh, particular uh, federal, federal deadlines. Uh, this was held to be part of Congress's Commerce Clause um, powers. So this was also not a problem. The problem came out of the third part of um, the law, which is the take title provision. And this provision specified that a state or a group of states in a particular region, uh, if they failed to provide uh, for the disposal of all the waste that is generated within their state by a particular date, then they had to, upon request of uh, whoever was generating the waste, the owner, uh, what they called take title to and possession of this waste and thereby become liable for um, all damages that could be suffered um, by uh, the generator or the owner uh, as a result of the fact that the state uh, had failed to um, adequately take possession of it. The court, in the opinion that's written by Justice O'Connor says that Congress crossed the line with this take title provision. Um, they said that uh, this is completely different than the other types of provisions where they are simply trying to encourage or discourage the states from engaging in particular types of behavior, uh, but rather we have now crossed the line into coercion. 
that it, this is simply too coercive to say to states that if you don't do the things that we are asking you to do, develop the sites, have the, the uh, policies for disposal of, rape, of uh, waste by certain dates, you are now going to take on the immense liability that comes from this radioactive um, waste, that that is really leaving the states uh, with no choice. And so the court says that you are really, in a way, just forcing them to adopt uh, certain the laws and regulations that you want them to adopt in terms of how to deal uh, with this uh, um, waste. And so this, the court tells us, is impermissible what they call commandeering of the legislative process. Um, that Congress is coming in and through this coercion, basically taking over the state legislative process, telling them what laws they need to pass, uh, when they need to pass them by, uh, and that with this we are crossing into an area that is a problem under the 10th Amendment. So one of the big questions here is what is so bad about commandeering? Uh, why, if we allow the federal government to use dangle money or to use carrots and sticks in various ways to get the states to do the things we want them to do, uh, why is it if they cross the line, do something so coercive uh, that we now feel like they are uh, all but simply ordering the state to enact certain kinds of laws, why is this a problem? And the answer is, uh, that the court tells us, is that it undermines accountability that voters will see the state acting, they will see the state and, you know, going through the process of lawmaking, um, enacting laws, but will be confused about why they are doing that and really about whom they should be able to hold accountable, whether it's their state representatives or their federal uh, legislatures, because uh, the way the federal government has now sort of come in and, and like a puppeteer used the legislative process of the state in order to uh, achieve some kinds of some kind of goal. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit when we talked about administrative power, you may recall this concern that when things get too fuzzy for the voters about who is holding the power and who is making the decision in various situations that then we might have these accountability concerns. What's interesting here is this line that the court is drawing between what it says are acceptable um, tools for the federal government to use. It can use the power of spending to either give money or withhold uh, money. It can also engage in direct regulation of private individuals or uh, groups, uh, even if those were contrary to the laws of the state, under the Supremacy Clause, they would preempt the state action, but it's this attempt through coercion, according to the court, uh, to regulate the state's legislative or control the state's legislative power that um, the court says goes too far. And we see again this more active version of the 10th Amendment. Justice O'Connor tells us that Article 1, Section 8, and the 10th Amendment, she says, are mirror images of each other. So if a power is not listed in Article 1, Section 8 as a power that Congress has to legislate, then it is therefore reserved to the states under the 10th Amendment. And if it is reserved to the states under the 10th Amendment, then Congress uh, does not have the power to regulate in that way. She compares it to the First Amendment. She says, uh, Congress can regulate uh, you know, the interstate market in books and magazines, she says, uh, up until the point where they would violate the First Amendment. And if they're regulating under their Commerce Clause powers, interstate market of books, um, the, the First Amendment would act as a limitation or a barrier to um, some of the types of regulation they might try to pass. We also see her pushing back on Justice Blackman's view in National League of City. You may remember when he was the fifth crucial vote and he said that he thought there was sort of a balancing of interests that we should respect the state sovereignty up until the point where the federal interest was so strong and the state interest perhaps was so minor or so weak. Um, and Justice O'Connor says no to that approach that there just is no balancing of uh, interests when it comes to the 10th Amendment. Now, Justice White is dissenting here, and he says that the court is 
ignoring what he says is a unique history of this particular set of laws, how it came about from this national conference of the governors, that the states themselves came together and said, we have a collective problem, we need to um, come up with a solution. They come up with a solution, but it included things that they did not individually have the power to do. They needed the federal government in a top-down way uh, to help them enforce uh, this set of regulations that they have. So sometimes referred to as cooperative federalism, uh, it's an idea um, as opposed to uh, dual federalism, which is often how we think about it. Cooperative federalism is the idea of local, state, and federal governments all working uh, together, that this can be a way to actually enhance state powers, that it's better uh, to have a process like this where the states come together, go to the federal government, we need your help to help us implement this plan that we think would help us all, uh, that that's better than simply the states just sitting there and the federal government coming in and uh, uh, having perhaps more intrusive regulations. But the court here rejects that, says the states can't constitutionally agree to give up their sovereignty. Justice White says this isn't a case of the federal government coming in and intruding upon these traditional integral state activities of um, state actions, uh, but rather Congress was really just serving as a referee here. And now we're going to be back into sort of a competitive situation between the states, which could really be in a way a race to the bottom where everyone uh, is much worse off in the end. The next key case is the Prince case from 1997. This case involved a challenge to the Brady Handgun Violence Pre uh, Prevention Act, an interim provision um, in that act. So this was a law that was named for James Brady. James Brady was the press secretary to President Reagan, and he was shot by John Hinckley when, during the uh, assassination attempt um, on uh, President Reagan in 1981. And this law requires firearm dealers to um, uh, forward forms to local law enforcement officers. And then it says that the law enforcement officers need to take, quote, reasonable efforts within five days to determine whether or not this firearm sale uh, was legal or not. So the question goes to the Supreme Court about whether this is something that Congress has the power to do or whether the 10th Amendment places a limitation on Congress enacting uh, a law like this one. And the court, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, by the four opinions, says uh, that this law was unconstitutional and they affirm or reaffirm the findings of New York versus United States. And the problem with this law, Justice Scalia tells us, is that it compels state officers to act. Um, and that this is something the 10th Amendment does not allow Congress to do. This, he says, violates the separation of powers, um, that Congress can't uh, shift uh, these kinds of executive powers uh, to the states. He relies on a number of things to support his conclusion. Um, he relies on a, a historical argument uh, about how in the early years, he says, uh, Congress didn't do this kind of thing. Um, they didn't uh, compel state officers to act. Um, in our discussion time, when we get together, um, I'd like to hear if you find this argument persuasive, is the absence of evidence that um, early uh, uh, Americans didn't use a particular power, um, how much should that indicate whether or not that power um, um, exists or not? Um, or could there be other reasons that they didn't use a power even if it was believed to exist? Justice Scalia also relies on the structure of the Constitution, uh, which he says is supposed to protect states from federal power, the sort of separation of the two spheres, that the president is given the power to execute um, laws, uh, he says, is part of this uh, structure. And then he relies on precedent, um, namely the New York versus United States um, case, um, to which I would ask whether or not you think uh, there's a distinction between what's going on in the New York case versus the Prince case. Is there something different about um, uh, what the Brady Bill uh, was asking of the states versus what it was doing in um, 
uh, in the New York case. And we once again get a dig at poor old Justice Blackman and his discussion about the balancing of interests, about the idea that maybe there's a very important federal interest at stake behind this bill versus the impositions that are being put on the states of these asking law, local law enforcement officers to you know, take reasonable efforts uh, to take a look at these um, sales as an interim provision until the rest of the bill uh, could be you know, sort of fully um, um, put into place. And the court, again, just Scalia says, nope, no balancing. This isn't any kind of a balancing act. It, this is not something we do on a case-by-case -case basis where we weigh burdens. This is something where, the, where it is either constitutional or it's not constitutional under the 10th Amendment. Justice uh, Stevens is writing the dissent here, and he disagrees with the majority on a number of grounds. He disagrees on the uh, argument that's based on history, maybe not unlike some of the disagreements we've seen between Justice Stevens and Justice Scalia over the Second Amendment. Uh, he says that the Articles of Confederation did allow uh, federal, the federal government to um, give these kinds of orders to the states and that what the Constitution did uh, was actually broaden those powers um, uh, uh, to include federal power um, also over individuals as well. He also makes a textual argument that the dissenting justices have made in some of these other cases saying that there just isn't anything in the text of the Constitution that supports this kind of limitation on the powers of Congress, that that's not what the Tenth Amendment says, that that's not what uh, a reasonable interpretation of the Tenth Amendment uh, would mean, um, but rather that Congress was indeed uh, acting pursuant to its Article I powers, and that that's the key question that we should be asking. And he also makes the argument that this would make sense, that we would want Congress to be able to have the power, particularly to respond to situations involving some kind of emergency or, or particularly a uh, particular pressing need. And so he stresses uh, uh, the need um, for the Brady Act in this case. And this is then, therefore, where we are with the Tenth Amendment in the Rehnquist Court era. Um, I sometimes can think of these as sort of our three or even four, depending on how you look at it, C's uh, uh, of thinking about the Tenth Amendment, uh, that there needs to be a clear statement. Uh, Congress needs to clearly state that it does intend for its law to apply to the states. Uh, you cannot commandeer, they cannot commandeer the state's legislative uh, process, and they also cannot compel state officers to act. Um, the potential fourth C would be they also can't be coercive. They can't have um, um, a high level of coercion to at the point at which the states would not have any really other clear choice but to um, react. So must have a clear statement, can't commandeer, can't compel, can't coerce. Uh, this is where we are with the Tenth Amendment today. And that's all I have for you for assignment number 25 about the 10th Amendment. And I will see you in the next video where we will talk about Congress and its uh, powers to tax and spend.